Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 126 of the American Muslim Experience, and we are back, and we are super excited. We are recording on the, um, what would this be? The the seventh, eve? The seventh, the, the, the day before the midterm elections. That's right. So the eve of the midterm elections, and I could not think of a better guest to have to talk about not only perhaps delve into uh, what the uh, possible outcomes may be of this uh, upcoming election, but more importantly, the sort of future of our democracy, as it were, um, because every election, as we're told, seems to be the most important election of a lifetime, and every election seems to be sort of an existential one. And so um, we have as our returning guest, Shadi Hamid. Shadi Hamid is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and an, and an assistant research professor of Islamic studies at, at Fuller Seminary. He is also a contributing writer at The Atlantic where he writes a monthly essay on culture and politics. His new book, which is the one we are really eager to discuss, is The Problem of Democracy, America, the Middle East, and the Rise and Fall of an Idea uh, from the Oxford University Press. His previous book, Islamic Exceptionalism, How the Struggle Over Islam is is Reshaping the World, was shortlisted for the 2017 Lionel, Lionel Gelber Prize for Best Book on Foreign Affairs, Hamid's first book, uh, which was Temptation of Power, Islamist, and the Ill- and Illiberal Democracy in a New Middle East, was named a Foreign Affairs Best Book of 2014. He also is the co-editor of Rethinking Political Islam with Will, uh, sorry, with Will McCants. Shadi continues appearing on major news outlets as such as N- MSNBC, Fox News, CNN, and others to discuss issues such as democracy in the Middle East, Middle East and here in the United States. And most importantly, this is his third appearance or reappearance on Diffuse Congruence. So anyway, uh, Shadi, welcome. Hey, Salam alaikum. Hi. Thanks for having me. By, by the way, so just in prepping for this interview, you know, of course, delved in, uh, listened to your, your a few of your other interviews and, and looked at the book and whatnot. And I think Perbez used a term here that I'm sure you have some thoughts on. He called this tomorrow's election uh, the future of democracy, you know, impacting the future of democracy. And I think I heard you say a few times, like, we got to decrease the temperature, but not say that every every election uh, you know, is is going is to an determine ex- yeah. determine the future of democracy, or is an ex- existential right. Uh, issue, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, whenever I hear someone say this is the most important election of our lifetime, that is a red flag. It shouldn't be the most important election of your lifetime, and it almost certainly isn't. Because if you said that 2016, you said 2020 was the most important election of your lifetime not every election can be the most important of your lifetime. So there's also just like a logical inconsistency there. And I think, I I think there's a certain turnoff from voters as well when they keep hearing that right on a recurring basis, like every election again, right. Is the most important one of their lifetime. So sort of, sort of desensitized to say perhaps some of the more crucial underlying issues that are at stake. Yeah, it's it's like when you cry wolf, if you say something right. over and over, people are going to start to doubt the seriousness of the claim. That's also why I have major objections to the whole democracy is about to die discourse. We're hearing this endlessly from liberals and Democrats here in the U.S. that if you don't vote for the Democratic Party, democracy will end as we know it. And that's not even really hyperbole. That is actually one of the prevailing messages that at least that I'm hearing. Yeah. So, you know. yeah, that can, I mean, yeah, it, it hires the temperature, it raises the stakes, it makes it feel existential. And I don't think that's really what we should be encouraging right now. Now you might say, well, if it is existential in, in fact, then to reflect that is just being accurate. But I also, I also do not think, that even if Trump wins in 2024, God forbid, that American democracy will die. But that's a little bit of a different, that's a can of worms. We don't have to get into that. But um, yeah, I'm not thrilled with my own party. I should say for people who don't know me, I I am a Democrat. Um, I'm left of center, even though some people don't think I should self-identify that way anymore. 
Um, Bad for business. And, uh, <laughs> I've only voted for Democrats my entire life. I've never voted for a Republican. But I think self-criticism towards your own side is exactly what we need now. We have a chorus of voices who say over and over again how bad Republicans and Donald Trump are. No one's doubting that. I just feel like it, we don't need another voice just to repeat the obvious. Mm -hmm. And I think some, some looking internally and looking inward is important. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of that on the left where it's like almost become this litmus test, right? So whether we, we, you know, we as liberals or liberals will take you seriously, depending on how, um, you know, vociferous you are in terms of demonizing Trump or demonizing MAGA and the movement, etc. So that sort of is becoming kind of the new litmus test with which we measure people who are welcomed into the liberal fold, right? And it's very similar, at least... Uh, again, just as someone who identifies similar to you, left of center, let's say, right, um, that that on the right we sort of we, we we sort of saw that as well, where where you know adherence or loyalty to Trump um, becomes, or the MAGA movement became kind of the litmus test for who took you seriously among the party or uh, among you know Republican supporters, um, and of course they of course Republicans have the term Rhino. I wonder if there is a Democratic equivalent to that. Right. Where we're going to begin <laughs> yeah. talking, right. People like Democrats will begin just sort of identifying you as a, as a, as a dino, <laughs> I suppose. Or yeah, right, it's right. possible. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. I, I actually haven't heard that. What is that? Sorry. Republican name, Republican in name only. Ah, right. Okay. Um, it's, it's a term used exclusively almost by Republicans to sort of call out Republicans who don't stick to the party line. Mm, right. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, I think the, I think it's interesting. You call it a can of worms. I I, I take it a problem. It, it's a problem when you have someone like Shaddy because I think you want to sort of talk about, you know, the election. And, of course, we're recording on the eve of the election. But at the same time, I do want to delve into your book because I think you do cover issues that are broader and more inclusive and than just the upcoming election. Um, and so yeah. – I guess it's to sort of begin in that vein. Um, I want to, you know, sort of you draw on a 2006 essay, uh, Limits to Democracy, written by the late British philosopher Roger um, Scruton, is it? Yeah. Yeah, where he sort of contrasts America and the West with Muslim-majority countries. And he writes here, the American norm is wholly unlike that of Islamic countries. People vote Democrat and find themselves ruled by Republicans. And they accept this, unhappy perhaps, but acknowledging a duty of obedience and a common loyalty that is far more important than the electoral differences of opinion. Um, and so of this, you write, for Scruton then, this ability or willingness to be unhappy but still obliging when one's adversary, uh, adversary sorry, wins an election is the precondition of democracy as we know it. And then and then you sort of go on to argue then that by these metrics or by this standard that we are failing as a, a as a democracy or as a prerequisite for that democracy. So I want to sort of have you sort of comment on that and maybe expound yeah, on that. Yeah, and I'm and I'm also curious like it feels like we got here recently because for the longest time, I mean, growing up I remember talking to Republicans and Democrats at the end of, at the end of the day, they would say, Hey, we're all American. Everybody would, there'd be the peaceful transition to power and everybody would be happy and Let's support the president. Kumbaya. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And, um, I, th I think I've, I've heard you talk about how in, in the middle East, right, you have the dichotomy between those who are believe in religion in the public sphere and those who are more like actually secular and, and want religion, nothing to do with the public sphere. It feels kind of like America's heading toward that same divide, but maybe you can comment in terms, how did we get to this place just in what feels like, you know, the last 10 years or whatever? Yeah. So, you know, in that sense, the Middle East offered a preview of what was to come here in our own country in America somewhat unexpectedly. I mean, I'm surprised like like you guys are that it turned out this way because when i when i left the us for a few years in 2009 i mean it was a very different vibe i mean precisely as you say there was a sense that both parties were firmly within the same tradition we disagreed on major issues but we didn't really question the basic sense that the others are american and they have to be part of the process and that um, you know, 
there is an American lineage and tradition mm -hmm. and the commitment to the founders and the constitution and so forth. When I came back to the U.S. in 2014, you start to see this fraying. And then obviously with the campaign in 2015 going into Donald Trump's election in 2016, we see a pretty dis decisive shift away from policy debates. You know, people still debate policy, but ultimately people vote for existential reasons. It's about the future of the republic. It's about what it means to be American. It's about culture, religion, identity. And these are things that are just much harder to compromise on. And those are precisely the cleavages that were present during the Arab Spring in the Middle East. So I think there's quite a bit to learn from, you know, less developed regions, let's say. And Americans don't think that obviously they're exceptional. And in some ways, you know, I, I think America is exceptional, but I think it is time to think about how other regions of the world have contended with these kinds of cultural, religious, and identity-oriented divides. And it's scary. And that's why people are freaking out. Um, and they were certainly freaking out um, in the Middle East. But this did change. And it's interesting that if you look at Roger Scruton's essay, you know, he was complaining about Muslim-majority countries. It was om almost like, who are these pesky Arabs and Muslims who can't get their act together, um, where... Unlike them, Americans and Brits and Europeans actually are able to live with democratic outcomes that are not to their liking because there is an opposition, but they're a loyal opposition. So, you know, precisely as he says in that quote, you know, if Republicans win, we're pretty pissed off, but it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And we can live with that and we can live to fight another day four years later at the ballot box. So that is, I think, Part of a bygone time. That is not the way people treat politics in America anymore. And I think there's just a broader universal convergence. If you look at major democracies, old or new, many of them do feel existential. So Brazil, Israel, India, Poland, Hungary, Italy, Sweden. I mean, you name it, this is, this is where we're going. I'm thinking about the tipping point, right? If I look back, for Democrats... It feels like Trump was was the 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 tipping point. But if you look at for Republicans, and I'd love to hear this, this is a question. I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective. It feels like Obama coming into into uh, into the into office was the tipping point um, because that's when I started hearing my Christian friends talk about, oh my God, our rights are going away. Uh, we're being oppressed. I, and we're being oppressed. Um, you know, and so on and so forth. That sort of language I heard for the first time about ten years ago, but. It feels like Obama was the tipping point. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, that's where some of this started. Um, some of the um, craziness, let's say. Mm -hmm. I don't think it had really spread to the mainstream of the Republican Party. Um, and, you know, if you look at the other candidates besides Trump in 2016, they were still more or less traditional Republicans, you know, people like Marco Rubio, Jeb Bush, and so forth. It's Trump who I think really broke the Republican Party and opened it up. So those voices were already there. Mm. But then Trump basically brings them to the fore and, and puts them at the heart of the party. But I think you're right to point to, I think Democrats have generally done a pretty bad job of reassuring non-liberals, especially Christian conservatives, that, that they're willing to respect the concerns and grievances and priorities of religious folk. And there's probably a limit to how much you can do that because the Democratic Party has become increasingly secular. But I think what we've seen in the last few years is a move towards a, a kind of hyper-wokeness around issues of culture, religion, and identity. So now when I hear my Christian conservative friends say sincerely, they're not being ironic or anything, that they feel that Christianity is under attack. I would have dismissed that as being a little bit silly um, 10 years ago, but I think I understand where they're coming from now. Right. So right. I can't really fault them for thinking that. I hope it's not too controversial to say, but even if that is what I think. 
No, I think it's, I think, I think that is a, a very important point. Um, and I think that it gets forgotten when we see politics being so tribal, um, is that, is that, you know, is that there are some serious issues, I think with, but where you have, first of all, a two party system, and then both of those parties end up going to extremes within their own political spectrum. So if the left is going extreme left and if the right is going extreme right, then, you know, what about the majority of us who are in the middle, right? And and so th I think that is really one of the sort of, to me at least, as someone who considers himself relatively moderate as or in the middle, as where neither party really speaks to my interest. You know, real quick, I think there's gonna be a portion of our listeners who are completely flabbergasted by the idea that Christians are being, you know, oppressed or whatnot. I, I think, to be honest, I've learned to understand it by talking to my, to my Christian friends. I, I kind of get it. Um, generally, in, as a parent, you can see how, like, the, the, you know, raising kids as uh, about with uh, the concept of God and whatnot. That's that's a challenge. But but how how does that how does that translate into like Christians saying that actually their rights are being taken away? I can see challenges with raising, for example, Christian kids because people are just less religious, right? How does that translate into government oppression? Um, maybe you can just help our listeners understand yeah, yeah, sure. why, no. why a Christian would feel that way. It's, it's a good question. And, you know, where I part ways from some of these um, Christian critics of the status quo is I don't think America is an authoritarian state. So oftentimes you'll hear this kind of language of oppression you know, come on, guys, like, you know, get your critiques in order and, and in proportion because we are not living under a dictatorship. And as someone who has lived under dictatorships, you know, I am pretty confident America is still a pretty awesome place to live and that it's a democracy. And that's why I think actually that immigrants and children of immigrants, we need to actually import more of them into the U.S., because no one has a deeper appreciation for the American ID and American democracy than people of color who are recent immigrants, because we know what the alternative is. And that's just really the people who don't know what the alternative is. They tend to think that everything is falling apart all the time. So anyway, but like, I think that, um, like, I think that we as left of center folks, we underestimate the extent to which the left of center liberals completely dominate the cultural space in America. If you think about all the major media outlets and newspapers, all the big universities, um, think about really any mainstream institution and it leans left and especially on cultural and religious issues. So mm -hmm. we're talking about a secular liberal consensus among elites and if you diverge from that you're seen as weird a curiosity or you're actively opposed especially so for example if you are someone who is open about opposing gay marriage you're probably going to have some difficulty making it in mainstream institutions there will be a reputational cost there will be potentially career costs Correct. if you express positions like that openly. If you take objection to some of the discourse around gender now, mm -hmm. and we can maybe unpack that a little bit. More no, I would love to. Yeah. Yeah. Then. Okay. So there is pretty much a third rail in American debates right now. I don't really like talking about it, but um, it is something that we have to contend with around, you know, Stuff like gender, sexuality, trans rights, being non-binary, the fact that there are now a whole panoply of choices right. of what to be gender-wise, and those choices are being introduced at a relatively young age. These are things that have become so dominant, and there's been such little tolerance of dissent on those questions. So it can sometimes make a Christian conservative feel like they're a dissenter in an authoritarian state, not because anyone is directly oppressing them, but because there is a level of, of fear and shaming when it comes to expressing certain quote unquote bad ideas that are seen as bigoted retrograde. And I haven't even brought up the stuff on race and, you know, um, you know, I'm, 
I'm a Democrat who thinks that the Democratic Party has embraced a certain set of woke ideas around group identity that go against a lot of what I believe as an American, but also as a Muslim. You know, I, I believe that people should be judged as individuals, not as representatives of a group. So I think it pisses people off a lot when they find out that I'm a brown Arab Muslim person, but I don't, you know, I don't necessarily fit into a stereotype of what a person of color or a Muslim is going to say politically. And for a white liberal, like they're like, wait, what's going on here? Why is this person not playing their assigned role of being a good liberal Democrat who toes the party line, especially before an election? And they, some people see me as betraying the mm-hmm. cause when so much is at stake. They're like, Shadi, you have these criticisms. How can you possibly speak about them and write about them before an election? First of all, I think they're maybe overestimating my electoral impact. I, I don't know if I myself <laughs> can, right. you know, but I, look, I'm flattered I, by I, it. And I did see your interview with the... Um, Maddie Hassan. Uh, Maddie Hassan, yeah. That, <laughs> he was, yeah. He was, uh, he was coming hard. Yes, that yeah, that was you know an in, intense debate, and a lot of people, some people really liked it, some people did not like it, which is precisely as I would expect it. Um, right. But I think some people who were not familiar with me assumed that I was like a right wing apologist or yeah. a, you know, or a Trumpist. The idea of a Democrat criticizing their own party, they couldn't like that. That is not something they actually are exposed to all that often, and that's unfortunate. Yeah, because, you know, I think that if each of us as Americans focused on our own side, because that's who we have the most influence with, like, I'm not going to have a huge influence with MAGA Republicans. They're not my friends. They're not my family. I don't necessarily get invited onto their media outlets all that often. When I do, I definitely say yes, because I do want to reach that new audience and challenge them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But generally speaking, I'm trying to make the case to um centrist or center left or left or folks on the on the on maybe the harder left and that's where that's what i'm trying that's that i think is what we should try to do agree yeah you know i i think you raised some you raised a lot of good points and i want to make sure we're not sort of going all over the place in the discussion so i'd like to sort of recalibrate and stay a little bit more focused um because i you know i think one of the interesting things that you've you, you just mentioned and it was in response to omar's question about why certain say christians may feel like they're persecuted or their rights are being taken away um you know i think we can talk about religious people broadly and not you know yeah. whether it's just christian, it's just christian exactly christian or muslims because a lot of what you're echoing um shadi is, is certainly not lost to Muslim ears, right? The idea that there's become this new sort of woke um, orthodoxy, or that there's that there's this new orthodoxy that is, that has emerged, whether it's it's on college campuses, whether it's on whether it's in corporations. I mean, Omar and I both have day jobs, so right, we have to be we have to you know there's certainly a sort of orthodoxy that we are very cognizant yeah. of, or 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 entertainment like Disney, right? What do you mean? You, Sorry, you, I'm just going down the list. The <laughs> right, list, right, 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 <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. So, 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 this orthodoxy. In, in fact, I think in in, in is it uh, McWhorter talks about this sort of woke, this new wokeism becoming sort of a new religion, and so th- yeah. that same very idea of orthodoxy is certainly there. And so, I think religious people in general, and we saw this w- 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 playing out in Dearborn where you had Muslim parents who were leading the, the protest or, um, you know, um, you know, mm-hmm. feeling a yep. sense of being disenfranchised by the school board because of the type of education that was being taught specifically around in- issues of gender, of sexuality. Specifically around the books, the, and, bo- the books right. in the library. The whatnot. books in the library and whatnot. So, so it, it, I think it crosses quote unquote religious lines to just people who feel a th- who, who feel threatened because of this new sort of orthodoxy or feel that they have to walk a tight rope because of this orthodoxy. Um, so I, yeah, I, I totally, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yes. And, I'm sorry. And, no, no, no. Go, go ahead. But, 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 but because I, but I, because I, I do want to come back to Mahdi's argument or Mahdi the the interview you did with Mahdi Hassan because I think that raises a certain different issue that I want to raise with you. But um, going back to this idea of of orthodoxy, I think one of the observations you make, um, I, I think um, it's in chapter. Well, I'm forgetting, but you, like when you talk about religion in the Middle East. 
um, as being broader than just practice. Like a person can be considered or a person will consider themselves quote unquote religious, um, even if they're not say, for example, like practicing Muslim. So um, because the issues that they can, that they care about are broader, they're cultural, they're around issues of gender and sexuality and crime and, and so on. And so I think uh, we can we can see the analog here in the United States where, um, you know, you know, it's not just talking about religious people, but people who, for example, adhere to quote unquote traditional values. And so I, I think you make a really good case for this analog to be drawn between people who are quote unquote religious in the Middle East and people who care about these same issues here in the United States. So I, I was wondering if you could sort of invite you to sort of comment on that. Yeah, yeah. And, th and that's where the Middle East can can teach you a lot. Um, and, and I think that for anyone who's lived in the Middle East during some of these crucial periods, you know, you bring a lot of insights. It darkens your view of human nature, of course. There's that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but that's why, you know, you know, in, in the book, I really do try to unpack these democratic dilemmas because they're present. They're, they're present really everywhere you look because democracy doesn't necessarily produce good outcomes. And that's really um, what I try to explore right. Um, in the book more broadly, this question of what do we do when democracy produces bad outcomes? Could you talk about do that? Do we outcome? learn to live with that? Right. Should we learn to live with that? Well, and that was the question that was being asked in the Middle East. Exactly. Many years. Right, right, right. And, and but answer, I, yeah. I was wondering if you could just pause real quick because I think bad outcomes, right? I want you to sort of define that a little bit further because, I mean, on the one hand, bad outcomes could be, well, I'm a Democrat and Republicans sweep tomorrow. Well, that's a quote unquote bad outcome versus, for, for example, a bad outcome being elections being held in the Palestinian territories and Hamas is elected. Or bad outcome could be that the quote unquote that, that the Muslim Brotherhood was elected, um, you know, and Morsi comes to power. So I, I want you to sort of define what you mean by bad outcomes, or perhaps you mean both of those things. Yeah, sure. So when I when I say the bad outcomes thing, mm -hmm. I usually put it in scare quotes. The <laughs> word bad, right? Because we don't necessarily agree anymore on what a bad or good outcome is. That's part of the problem. There is no shared sense of reality or moral standards. So in a case like Egypt or Tunisia, when an Islamist party, you know, wins an election and then comes to power, if you're an Islamist, you'd be like, oh, good, democracy produces good outcomes. If you're a secularist, you'll be like, oh, my God, it, this is what democracy brings us. I like democracy in theory, but if it means this in practice, maybe I don't want it after all. And that's precisely what many secular and liberal elites were saying in Egypt, they at first they would have said, yes, of course we would like more democracy. Why not? Who would say no to that? But then in practice, you see them diverging and saying, well, daddy, you come here and you preach democracy to us, but you can go back to the U.S. anytime you want. You're not even properly Egyptian. And I suppose they're correct about that. I mean, I am... Egyptian American, but America is my primary country of um, of residence, concern, and loyalty. So they're like we're the ones who have to live with the consequences. You know, I was of joke. elections. I always joke about us hyphenated individuals, right? You don't realize how fully American you are until you visit the first part of your hyphen. So you know, like Egyptian <laughs> exactly. American, right? You probably didn't realize how American you were until the first time you set foot in Cairo. Um, exactly. you know, and for me, the analog would be the first time I went to Hyderabad, for example, or India, right? So, anyway, sorry, just to just to yeah, just to yeah, comment. No, that's a really good point. But, yeah. Um, so. In this sense, like democracy is actually what makes democracy great is its uncertainty. Mm -hmm. But that's also what makes it scary to a lot of people. It's frightening to not know what's going to happen before it happens. And we as human beings, like even the fact, you know, some some liberals now are threatening. I guess they always do this every couple of years, threatening to leave the country if Trump, Trump or DeSantis wins, whatever it might be. But, um, you know, that level of 
uncertainty about your future, the course that your life will take, even where you might live because of an election, that is a pretty weighty thing. And not everyone is able to process that level of uncertainty. For them, they may panic or they may say, well, <laughs> we prefer a military coup to overthrow the democratically elected Islamist government, which is precisely what happened in Egypt. Most of my relatives, almost all of them actually, um, were vigorous supporters of the military coup. Hmm. And not only that, they supported the subsequent massacre of Muslim Brotherhood supporters a month after, where about a thousand people were killed in broad daylight over the course of a few hours. So yeah. when, and also just because I've seen that, I know that when people talk about how evil Republicans are and that Republicans are fascists and are about to destroy America and end democracy as we know it, <laughs> I have a, I think that I have a little bit more proportion in terms of the words that I use because, okay, I don't really know many Republicans who are marauding around and supporting what, you know, large scale massacres of their political opponents. And one of the big reliefs I think is that despite the majority of Republicans believing in the big lie that the election was stolen from Donald Trump, you know, thank God that people aren't actually translating that sentiment into action. Like, and that actually, I think tells us a lot. Open rebellion, Ar armed rebe yeah, rebellion. Yeah, civil exactly. Well, I mean, you might think that if people, if people thought the election was really stolen, if they believed that with every core of their being, it would be the worst thing imaginable. We would mean American democracy has ended as we know it. An election was stolen. Now we were becoming an authoritarian regime. You'd think that people, if 74 million people voted for Trump and the majority say they believe that election was stolen from Trump, but barely anyone is actually, you know, converting that into action, it tells you that there's a gap between dream politics and real politics. Sure, sure. So so like rhetoric on the left and, 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 and actual reality. But I would push back or I guess to play devil's advocate would be to say, well, what about January 6th, right? I mean, what we saw happen was, I mean, again, if you, if you listen to the rhetoric on the left, was it arguably a coup that was that, 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 that did, wasn't fully actualized, but perhaps next time it could be. Right. And so, yeah. and, and, and I, and I want to ask you about, and, and this goes to the interview I think you had with Mahdi because his argument was essentially this, which is, okay, fine, we can talk about bad outcomes and how people deal with bad outcomes, but what about bad actors, right? What about, for example, to you, to, and to borrow a sports metaphor, something I'm way out of my league here, so Omar might have to help me, but <laughs> if, you, if you put it in a, in a sports analogy, like it's, it's one thing to talk about that the losing team should concede and, and lose right gracefully but yet it's another thing to talk about the fact that perhaps the winning team um didn't play by the rules right so so i want you to talk about that dichotomy there because yeah. i think that that's what i think that was what mahdi was getting at in that interview as well they're talking about bad actors here i mean we're talking about the upcoming midterms you know you have at least i think 300 people on the ballot 300 republicans excuse me on the ballot who are exactly what you how you identified as people believing in the big lie that the election was stolen um so you know how do you, how do you reconcile that yeah okay sorry guys i had to, um i'll get to that in a second i sure. just had to switch out of my earphones because they're dying but is it going to be a problem if I just speak without earphones? As long as you can hear us, I can. Okay, that yeah. should be fine. No, no, you're you're good. You, you're like you, uh, we can hear you clearly. Yeah, excellent. So, this is why, at the end of the day, I'm still going to support Democrats because I don't think there is moral equivalent. So, as critical as I am about my own party, the Democratic Party. Republicans are worse when it comes to respecting democratic outcomes. And for me, that's the non-negotiable. I mean, I wrote a book about it that this is like, this is what you have to do. You have to commit to respecting democratic outcomes that you feel are personally threatening. If you don't do that, you're not a small D Democrat. And then every, you know, then what else do you have? There's no way 
to regulate conflict between different parties, then it's just the rule of um, coercion and power and aggression against the other, you know? So uh, that is a big problem in the Republican Party. Now, the question is, though, um, are there enough election deniers to completely change the way the Republican Party um, acts well, at some future moment? So I think that the latest numbers are, there, are that if you look at, um, you know, congressional candidates, attorneys general, governors, um, and state senators, and so forth, that about 35%, according to 538, are election deniers in a proper sense. So we're still not talking about a complete takeover of the Republican Party, but also it goes back to this question of rhetoric versus practice. How many of these people are going to actually act on their denialism in 2022, i.e. now, or 2024, which is what I think most people are concerned about. Now, a few different things would have to happen. First, the election would have to be close enough where you can try to decertify results in a particular area and shift, you know, if it's a clear outcome, there's there's not a whole lot that you can do. So we're talking about a speculative argument that requires a number of things to happen. Agreed. You know? But I'm sorry, I, sorry, I don't want to cut you off, but I think it's important to note here because it's not just a quantity argument because you're talking about an election that can be that can go one way or another based on key battleground states. So as long as you can secure um, you know, election deniers in certain counties or certain, um, you know, even well, I mean, certainly certain states that are the battleground states. And, you know, everyone knows who those are, you know, like, like, like which, which states we're talking about. Um, you can, you can, you know, sh uh, switch the outcome. So, okay, this is where I'm a little bit more skeptical because, first of all, it is, there are legal challenges. So if anyone actually tries to like ballot stuff properly or literally change the results, it's not clear to me exactly how that works in practice without there being a lot of outside scrutiny, certainly from the media. Just the part of the advantage that we have is that there are checks and balances in our system. We do have a media which can be annoying because they're obsessed with how bad Republicans are, but it's also good in the sense that if there's any funny business in 2024, there'll be armies of reporters uncovering True. that this is going on. There will be legal challenges. So the idea that Republicans on the local or state level will just be able to impose this and the rest of us have to just go along with it, Again, it requires a few logical jumps, <laughs> and there are enough Republicans who wouldn't, and we saw that in 2020. That's right. There were enough Republicans who, when push came to shove, were not willing to engage in this fantasy and pretense. Right. I'm not, I don't want to dismiss this out of hand. I am concerned about it, and that's why I hope, um, well, whoever it is, Biden or whatever Democrat, actually becomes the that's the great that's the great unknown right <laughs> that's yeah. a whole nother topic but yeah yeah i would like democrats not to test this proposition and actually do better at winning elections <laughs> Thank and you. persuading people to vote for them instead of using because there's only so much we can do if if your whole thing is dependent on fear and right. saying that the other side are gonna kill democracy i don't know if that as a message is going to be effective and i would actually argue that based on the polling that we're seeing thus far it isn't effective, especially with brown folks. And I, you know, I've, I've, I've been saying that there's a brown backlash going on, which goes back to what you were talking about in Dearborn. Right. Um, Hispanics are leaving the Democratic Party in droves. Yes. Black men are not to the same extent, but you know, there is, there is some shift there. For sure. Arabs, Muslims, just people of color more generally. There is a massive problem here. There so is clearly telling them, browbeating them into voting for the Democratic Party by saying, listen, guys, don't vote Republican. They're going to end our democracy. So vote for us, even though we didn't govern particularly well on the local level. It depends a little bit on where you live. Yep. But we can. But the argument also seems to be even if we promote radical ideas on gender, 
race, abortion, um, crime, crime. Mm -hmm. vote for us regardless, because all that matters is democracy. It's a way of foregoing accountability and responsibility. And it's also patronizing to talk to talk to people of color and tell them basically you have to vote for us. You don't have a choice. Um, even though we're doing things that are pissing you off on the local level. I mean, especially if you have kids in public school and you're worried about things like gender identity, that hits a lot harder on a personal level with your own family and your own community more than this kind of a little bit still speculative and somewhat abstract argument about the future of democracy. So I think that even if we are worried about 2024 and we can imagine a scenario where Republicans actually bring us to the to an actual constitutional crisis, the best way to prevent that from happening is to not focus on that because it's not going to appeal to people who are much more concerned about local issues that actually affect their lives and livelihoods. No. The, um, the, the things you're describing, are those getting quote unquote worse meaning are are those demographics you're just de you're describing are there any efforts or awareness self-awareness in the democratic party to to bring those folks back into the fold or is it going to be an acceleration of of the the, the direction world. we've seen yeah 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 well it depends on where you live so um clearly democrats haven't been very cognizant of these concerns in dearborn michigan <laughs> that's why there was a bit of a muslim revolt there I'll just say where I live in D.C., I'm I'm very concerned. Like crime, crime is becoming a bigger issue. Now there's a debate about, you know, this is the problem also with uh, liberals. They kind of gaslight you when you bring up crime. That's right. Say, oh, because well, for people living in San Francisco, we couldn't possibly know anything about crime. <laughs> Oh, oh, that's that, that's iron. <laughs> that's sarcasm. I will thank you for picking that up. <laughs> Well, yeah, this this was the whole thing that Chesa Boudin, uh, the, um, the district attorney, would say to people. Right. I actually had a friend who told me privately that, like, they, like a friend of theirs came across Chesa Boudin on the street. And, like, Chesa Boudin would still, even after he was, like, ousted from his position in the recall, he was still telling people, like, guys, like, crime wasn't actually as bad as you thought it was. But right. this is... Uh, you know, and, he, and the whole the whole argument is basically um, here. I'm going to give you statistics. I'm going to show you the science. Right. Here's the numbers on all these different crime categories. And actually, what you see with your own eyes is not true. I what was, you're feeling in your own local community isn't true. It's actually not as bad as you think. I was just about this to say it crazy. sounds a, right. It sounds a lot like don't believe your lying eyes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I have to deal with this a little bit in D.C. People right. can kind of mess with the numbers. If you have an ideological endpoint, if you want to minimize the incidence of crime, there's ways to work with the numbers to get the result that you want. You focus on one crime category over another or you change the year that you're comparing it to. There's a lot of statistical funny business that you can do. But... Um, but at the end of the day, if people are concerned about something and they're bothered by it, you have to listen to them and you have to acknowledge their grievances instead of telling them that they are Republican apologists for emphasizing the importance of crime. Thank you. Right. Yeah. And but we also know on the on on the gender issues. Oh, yeah. That is not I mean, that is just something there's just so much evidence of it anecdotally. So if people tell you, well, look, there's literally this book. Or there's literally this teacher at my kid's school who said this to my kid and my kid came back. Mm -hmm. Like at some point, you can't just tell people that they're imagining things that are actually happening to them. Exactly. Exactly. And I think, and, and I think, which is why we're like, I, I, I like your, when you talk, like you've written about this, about the Brown revolt. Is that what you called it? Sorry. The, I'm sorry. The Brown, the brown backlash. 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 Thank you. Exactly. Catchy, right? No, very <laughs> catchy. You need to coin that right away. Um, but no, seriously. And, and I, cause I, I see it anecdotally. I see it broadly speaking, um, among the exact groups that you're talking about. Um, Muslim, Brown people, you know, people of color, um, and, uh, you know, and, and even immigrants who would, 
uh, you know, uh, certainly after the Obama years, consider never voting Republican. Um, but I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, after the Trump years, but only because of the issues that we're highlighting here um, are, 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 have no choice because they have to vote their conscience. Yes. You know, and it's hard to argue against someone's conscience. That's right. right. I mean, that's, that's right. So I, I, I know we need to wind down here and, and wind up. Um, so, and again, I, I, like I said at the outset, the challenge of having someone like you on the show is I could literally just pick your brain and just chat for hours. But, you know, j just to kind of, as we wind down then, um, you know, what do you see as like, if you were to write a playbook that, that the Democrat, the democratic party needs to, or should adhere to, with regards to um, continuing not to bleed brown, as it were. <laughs> oh, I like that. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's good. another one. There you go, the Shaddy. <laughs> there you so, go. Anyway, uh, what would that what would that look like? What would that playbook look like? Yeah. So, you know, if you're talking to more socially conservative constituencies, you got to acknowledge their social conservatism. Mm. And I think for a long time, Muslim voters in America were suspending. They were still, on average, socially conservative, but because other issues took precedence, correct, they didn't have to worry about the tension all that much. Like during the Iraq War, post 9-11, Patriot Act, Trump's Muslim ban, all these things hit hard on very key Muslim-related mm -hmm. issues. Right. And then, but they, those no longer dominate. Exactly. So, like, it's really remarkable to look at how Trump basically stopped talking about Muslims. I don't know if he did it consciously, but no one like no one seems to really care about us all that much. And I sometimes I look back to 2015, 2016, when people were talking about literally banning Muslims from entering the country. And it was like the talking heads would talk about this nonstop. They were talking about us. It was crazy. It was nuts. But, you know, we've come a long way since then. Right. Things have really changed. And I suppose we have the woke folks to thank because now they've become public enemy number one. And now I think a growing number of Republicans see a major opportunity to peel off um, socially conservative folks of color. Yeah. So the Democratic Party just has to be more accommodating of religious diversity. Yeah, They can't gaslight people by telling them that their concerns are not real on these key cultural concerns that people get really worked up about, understandably. I mean, I don't have kids, but if I did, and they came back home and told me about like, oh, okay, this is this is actually crazy, but it's, it's legit. Because, so I talked to this professor last week and she told me a crazy story. I still don't actually believe, I, I have no reason to believe that she's lying to me. Um, and I still can't believe it. <laughs> she basically said that her six-year-old came back from public school and six years, six years old. And at some point told her mom, am I a he or a she? Because one of their friends um, is apparently non-binary. It's not clear to me how you can be six and non-binary, but even if that's a fairly rare case, there's a, there's much more common cases about this happening to, to kids who are 10, 11, 12. That I have heard from a number of people directly, whatever it is, you know, it's a legitimate concern for parents to have if you come from a socially conservative background where issues around gender identity and family structure are important. That's right. So Democrats don't have to, you know, cater to those socially conservative views. All, all they have to do is to be respectful of them and to not impose a litmus test on things that are very polarizing, such as this. I mean, that's just one one basic way of looking at it. I think, I mean, I, was, I don't want to cut you off. I mean, I, but, but I think that's a beautiful point because I mean, again, speaking from a corporate perspective, and I know, I know Omer can certainly relate to this, you know, corporations under, you know, there, there's a lot of initiative around these issues of DEI, right? Diversity, equ equality, and inclusion. And, and all I think a lot of conservative, what a lot of socially conservative people are saying is that's all fine, but allow us to be on the table as well. When you talk about diversity and and inclusion specifically, we need to feel a sense of inclusion as well, that we feel a certain way around these issues and we need to be as accommodated. I'm not asking for it. I'm not calling for bigotry, but at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm calling for accommodation, right? So exactly. I think that's very well put. 
unfortunately, I think a growing number of oh. liberals see precisely what you described as itself bigotry. You're right. You're right. <laughs> so, I mean, so that's the problem. So, I mean, the, the overarching thing here is to what extent we as individual Americans are comfortable with deep difference. And I think this is especially... Like what I tell, so if I talk to a right wing audience, I tend to tell them, like, listen, you know, imagine that Biden or someone like him wins in 2024. You know, I want to push them. Are you going to respect that outcome? Or is there going to be a repeat of 2020 where we start having this election denialism thing all over again? And we have to push them on that. But our side, we got to push them. And this is, you know, part of the debate I had with Mandy Hassan on, on Morning Joe was if Trump wins fair and square and no foul, no obvious foul play in 2024, are we willing to accept that he will have been legitimately elected? I think we have to be able to answer that in the affirmative, as difficult as, as that might be. When I say this as someone I've written about this, how I cried the night that Trump won in 2016. Why? Because my mom wears a headscarf and I was talking to my brother late at night. My parents by then were asleep. And we were like, we weren't so much concerned about ourselves. We were concerned, like, what does this mean for mom and dad? Right. What does this mean for people who are visibly Muslim? But the amazing thing is that the following morning, my parents don't think that elections are existential. So they just go to sleep without, you know, which is a nice <laughs> reminder. You don't have to stay up until, like, everything is clear. Right. Up to my dad, I'm, like, freaking out. And, you know, my dad just basically sits me down and he's like, Shadi, this isn't the end of the world. People voted for Trump because they wanted to vote for Trump. You write about democracy and now that you're complaining about the de democratic result, like, you know, this is, this country is a democracy. There are checks and balances. And he's like, I believe that we'll find a way to get through this. And it was just like, and again, like he's, he's not very politicized. He's not someone who's on Twitter seeing like, all these people freaking out 24 seven. And he was able to ha to kind of establish some distance between himself and what happened. And I think that's what we all have to do. So we imagine the worst case scenario, but then we try to think about how we can react to it without, without losing our minds, because how is it going to help if we start saying, Oh, democracy is ending as we know it. Like, yeah. how is that? help us be more effective in the political sphere? How is that going to help us actually be reasonable and try to persuade others to understand our concerns and fears? What, what you're asking for is a, a basic, some, a little maturity, the maturity your, your parents are demonstrating. You're asking Americans to have a, a bit of that maturity when it comes to how they look at the other party, right? Yeah, but it's not even just maturity. It's a certain way of looking at the democratic idea. And this, this goes back to the problem of democracy is how do we find a way to commit to democratic outcomes that we don't like? Mm -hmm. And then that's a very personal individual question because some people struggle with that, obviously. And I'm not going to pretend that it's an easy thing to do, but that's where I think at the end of the day, either Either you're willing, and I think part of the issue too is that if you believe that history moves in a linear direction and that there's a progressive story to the moral universe, that the arc of history bends towards justice and so forth, you'll start to think that the people who vote against progress are enemies, not just of you, but of history. Like this is a danger when you actually start to have a certain view of progress. You're right. So there's actually like, there's ideological and philosophical aspects that I think feed in to this existential tenor. And that's where I think people actually have to become much more self-conscious of the fact that history doesn't always move in a straight line and people disagree on what progress is like the arc of history. Fine. We're at a point now though, where I think there's legitimate debate about what progress actually means. Is it progress? If a child comes back and says, I want to be non-binary at like the age of eight, um, I think reasonable people should be able to, to disagree on that, right? But now we're sort of taking these new controversial issues and saying that they're part of the same story that animated the civil rights struggles of the 1960s. Right. 
And that is an extrapolation that I think has to be questioned, or at least people have to say, well, okay, I think this is progress, but if the other person doesn't think it's progress, they are not beyond the pale. But that, that just requires, you know, I think that that's doable, but apparently a lot of people struggle with that, but we have to try, I think. Yeah. Right. You know, it's interesting. You talk about um, the leadership, leadership needing to kind of, uh, like for example, Trump, Trump, and Trump and Biden, both of them. Or let's let's talk about Biden specifically. He comes from that era of of pre you know pre two thousands where people got along, they reached across the area, they're friends with each other, they went to dinner together, even though they're in different parties. But it's interesting that he is the leader of the current party, and instead of him changing the party, the party has in a, in a sense changed him. And I think that kind of points to the fact that people see him as weak. Right. And, I'm, and without without doing too much forecasting, I'm curious what your thoughts are in terms of Biden specifically in the 2024 election. Um, put asking you to put on a bit of a, a bit of your fortune telling hat here. And where do you see this headed? I mean, Trump Trump's getting older. DeSantis is coming in kind of um, strong second. There seems to be no alternative to Biden. Uh, we saw Obama on the campaign trail. Uh, recently, and that brought back some memories about just how strong of a presence he was. But there's, there, there doesn't seem to be anybody. There doesn't seem to be anybody kind of on deck. Um, what What are you seeing in in DC? Like, there's no heir. There's no uh, heir to the uh, yeah. heir to the empire. There, there, there's no heir apparent. No heir apparent. Yeah. yeah, no heir apparent on the Democratic side. As much as perhaps you could argue that you know it, it's DeSantis for the Republicans. Um, whether or not Trump decides to run or not. So, yeah, a little bit of your fortune-telling hand, and then we'll close it out. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, yeah, I'm not... We don't have a great bench. <laughs> the Democratic Party hasn't been good at nurturing young folks, and especially young people who might not totally align with all the wokeness, I think. I think there is a lot of pressure, and all of us have to fight it. Um, I can get away with it, to some extent, but that's because I don't really have political ambitions. But if I had an idea that I was actually like gunning for something in the next four, eight, 12 years, I couldn't say the things that I'm saying now. See, like it's, you can only like free yourself rhetorically when you're like, you know what? I'm just going to say whatever I say and whatever happens, happens. And, you know, even to be fair, you, you, there, you also need a bit of professional and financial security to say certain things. Not everyone has that privilege, but also not everyone is brown. If I was a white person, I, I wouldn't say I, it would be really hard for me to say some of the things that I say. So in that sense, True. you know, there is maybe something called brown privilege too, that we get a little bit of a pass and we can push the boundaries a little bit more. That's why, like, I think, the future, the future's got to be brown, basically, to some, <laughs> to some extent. You, you can get, you can sell those, start selling those shirts. You know, you have the future is female shirts. You can start yeah. selling the future is brown shirts. Exactly, exactly. But you know, but what you said earlier about Biden, I think, is actually like quite telling that Biden was part of that previous era. But politics is also about personnel, and if you have a lot of people around you who are part of this younger, woker generation just sees things differently it's going to affect things um and it's also part of the reason trump wasn't able to realize his america first vision because he had to hire people who didn't who weren't necessarily on the same page um so presidents are limited in in some fundamental sense and if the party is moving in a particular direction you start to feel pressure to bend and if you start saying things, then maybe you start believing them. So maybe Biden was like, I got to play this game. I got to play this game. But we as human beings, we don't love cognitive dissonance. So if we find that we're saying things a lot, then we try to close, we try to close the gap and bring our beliefs closer to our rhetoric. And before you know it, you actually are sort of believing the things that you were just saying cynically in the beginning. And I think you see that with a lot of people. They're just kind of going along with the flow. And they sort of think to themselves, oh, well, this woke stuff isn't too bad. You know, I can be on the right side of history, probably for a good cause. I know there are some drawbacks, but maybe it's worth it in the end. You find a way to persuade yourself that this is in your interest and it's actually in line with your beliefs in some way. So, um, yeah, but as for who's to come, um, yeah, yeah, I actually, you know, well, clearly, 
it can't be Kamala because that's not going to work too well for Democrats if they do give that a shot. Right. And I honestly don't know. And I really, I do wonder about this. And part of the pressure too is that, um, I have to be careful about how I say this, but hmm, well, okay. I, I don't like the tokenism where you literally have an open position and you say preemptively that it has to be someone of a particular, not just a particular race or gender, but a particular, like they have to fit in all these boxes. I mean, first of all, it's not good politics because, you know, uh, you, you want to have like an open application process, so to speak. But I think there is this thing where even if we had a Bill Clinton type today, there might be a challenge for that person to actually get far enough because they'd be seen as too old school. Can you imagine like a white male candidate saying something like abortion be, abortion should be safe, legal, and rare? The Democratic activist base would just like run that person out, even though that might be the person who's able to actually reach a broader audience and peel folks um, from from the GOP. But, you know, I worry that we're limiting our potential in terms of who can actually run because there is this sort of discomfort with the very fact of being white and male, which, you know, I mean, you know, white and male people have their faults, but presumably they can't help being white and male. <laughs> Wow. So, yeah. Well, it's too bad that you don't have a political ambition, Shaggy, because um, I, 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 I would, I would uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would vote. Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. So if you if you were here, we would have kept talking, we would have poured some some more coffee and maybe extended this to a lunch, got some sandwiches and just kept going because we didn't touch on we didn't touch on Saudi Arabia. We didn't yeah. touch on Iran. Yeah. We didn't touch on the list goes on and on exactly. UAE and, yeah. and, and oh. so on. But um, which only I, means yeah. that we have to have you back. Um, but I really did. Like I said, one. Sorry, go ahead. You're, are you trying to? Say no, no. Something? Seriously, if you guys would like to do, you know, part two in a, in a month, couple of months or something, and just continue, or even like sooner than that. Like I'm definitely open because it does sound. I forgot that there were a lot of other topics. Yeah. <laughs> I, I forgot about Saudi Arabia for a second there. No, 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 like, like no worries. And I appreciate the offer to come back and, and the, or at least the, um, yeah, accepting the invitation preemptively. Um, but, uh, you never shied away from, in, from our invitations. And so I always want to thank you as well. Uh, this is the third time you we've had you back on the show and it's, it's always a pleasure. Um, and, do, you, do you ever come out here to the, to the Bay area? Yeah, I do. Well, Not hey. often, but sometimes okay. I do. So now I, I wasn't fully aware that you guys were in San Francisco itself. So now I know I'll let, I'll let you let you all know when I'm passing through. Oh, definitely. And we could do this in person, which we, we always love. Um, but um, anyway, yeah. I, as we close out, I really want to um, I really want to recommend your book. Um, I, I, I first of all, I appreciate the uh, the advanced copy that you gave us. Uh, but the book is out. It came out uh, in on, on, on the 15th of October. Um, you know, and I, I really encourage folks to check it out. The Problem of Democracy, America, the Middle East, and the Rise and Fall of an Idea. It's available now. You can check it out. Um, what I really appreciate about, about uh, what I really appreciate about Shadi is his way to sort of um, distill a lot of these ideas um, and, 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 you know, in, in a language um, and in a way that I think even the average person who doesn't spend hours on Twitter, um, you know, for an audience like your father, um, uh, you know, and so I, I really do um, encourage folks to check out your work, um, not to mention your myriad of pieces that appear in The Atlantic and other news outlets. So always a pleasure, Shadi. Um, I, I guess where can people engage you if they would do want to reach out or perhaps have you on yeah. uh, some other podcast? <laughs> that... Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, first of all, uh, thanks so much for having me. You know, it's a pleasure. Um, and uh, if people want to reach out uh, on Twitter, I'm at Shadi Hamid. So basically my name. I also co-host a podcast called Wisdom of Crowds, which you can find on major podcast platforms. And um, yeah, feel free to say hello on, on Twitter. That's probably where I'm most active. And you can just say that you're friends of Diffuse Congruence yeah. and Parvez and Omar, and that will go a long way. Oh, nice. Thank wow. You thank so you. No, that, I mean that all. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a great. Um, for listeners, as always, thank you for listening. If you, do, if you have questions, comments, suggestions, you can reach us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can also, of course, engage us on Twitter, Facebook. We're kind of available everywhere. Um, but as always, thank you for listening and uh, stay tuned for future episodes of Diffuse Congruence. Salakum, everyone. Take care.